Thank you for joining us for our presentation, Considering Difference, Making Dance Accessible. I'm Jess, a white woman in my late 20s with dark blonde hair. This presentation will contain subtitles and is BSL translated. This presentation is appropriate for all stakeholders within dance, namely those associated with dance venues or who are dance educators and teachers. The Considering Difference project and today's presentation has been put together by a team of One Dance UK staff. Hi, my name is Barney. I'm the membership manager at One Dance UK. And as someone who identifies as neurodiverse, every day I am reminded that we live in a neurotypical world and our creative arts industry is no different. So to provide input into an initiative such as this that champions safe and supportive dance environments to help ensure anyone with accessibility needs who wants to dance and express themselves and to flourish it's been such a pleasure and I hope this is just the start of what we can achieve. Hi, I'm Katie Stevens. I'm Office Manager at One Dance UK and Dance Assistant at Free Wheeling Dance, an inclusive dance group for dancers of all abilities and experiences. The potential conversation that this project could open up in the dance sector, along with other incredible resources around making dance spaces accessible to all members of the community, is a really exciting prospect. We believe that dance is for everyone, and this resource can help unpick barriers that many people are facing on their journey to and through the dance studio. Hello, my name is Erin Sanchez, and I'm the manager of the National Institute of Dance Medicine and Science, and the manager of health, well-being, and performance at One Dance UK. We value every person who engages in dance, and dance should be open and accessible to all. And I'm delighted to be working on this project because it brings together educators, artists, leaders, healthcare practitioners and researchers to ensure that dance venues and spaces are accessible, inclusive and welcoming for everyone who dances. Hi, my name is Jessica Lowe. I'm the Dancer's Health, Wellbeing and Performance Administrator here at One Dance UK and I'm a neurodiverse dancer and learner. No matter how or whether we choose to define it, we are all wonderfully different and dance by its very nature has the extraordinary potential to embrace difference in its expressivity. This project helps to communicate stories common to many dancers who have faced barriers in accessing and experiencing dance and it's the knowledge of those experiences that we can use to enrich dance for everybody going forwards. This project aims to increase awareness of the access barriers in dance spaces and highlight methods to enhance inclusion and promote independence and autonomy for all users of dance spaces. We would like to thank our external contributors for supporting the development of the Considering Difference project, a full list of whom can be accessed at the end of this presentation. Moving on now to talk about our methods. This qualitative investigation used a phenomenological, practice-based research design, meaning that we were investigating the lived experiences and perceptions of a particular group of people by means of practice in order to generate new applied knowledge. We conducted an initial rapid review of resources on access in the UK dance sector, in doing so, we identified a gap in dance-specific policy and practical guidance on accessibility for dance venues, aligned with the social model perspective. Under the social model, disability is framed as a social construct created by societal barriers which can be changed and eliminated, providing a positive model which identifies the causes of exclusion and inequality and proposes a solution. As a result of the evidence review, our aim was to address a gap in resources by developing an information sheet that would offer recommendations to all who manage and use dance spaces, contributing to the development of best practice guidelines and industry standards. To inform the information sheet, we used convenience sampling to recruit 25 dance professionals working with artists or who have a lived experience themselves of accessible and inclusive dance practice to take part in semi-structured interviews. Participants responded to questions such as, what do you think dance spaces should consider to make them more accessible? And what considerations do you think should be priorities? Inductive, reflective, thematic analysis was then undertaken for all interviews. A focus group was then held to undergo the process of member checking to ensure reliability and consistency of our findings. Although no ethical approval was sought given the nature of this practice-based project, all participants consented verbally to engage. In analysing the qualitative data, seven key areas in which difference was perceived as being most prominently identifiable were established. According to our findings, difference was most referred to as being relative to physicality, mental health, multiple and profound learning difficulties, specific learning differences, gender, age and economic circumstance. This data was then further organised into codes which identified that key factors surrounding space 
were pivotal to framing conversations relative to the aforementioned perceived categories of difference. These codes were acknowledged as being the physical dance space, such as your dance studio or a community town hall, the virtual dance space, for instance, an online Zoom class or a company website, the internal dance space, which we might refer to as being the emotional environment that we create for our dancers, and then lastly, space in the metaphorical sense, being made for conversation and communication to take place. From there, we learnt that key themes relative to these spatial considerations were to do with arrival, digital delivery and inclusive diction and diverse communication. We will now describe each of these findings in a little more detail, along with some of the considerations that participants identified to improve access surrounding these areas. Finding number one centres on the theme of arrival. By this, we mean how somebody arrives at, enters and navigates your dance space. One participant stated that, Disabled artists who arrive in an inaccessible dance space have just had to get on an inaccessible bus or tube. They've probably been stared at or commented on. You're making your way in a highly normative world and then you arrive at an inaccessible dance space. So, it's good to bear in mind what we can offer even if it's tiny. We know that the world isn't accessible, so we are doing everything that we can to make this space accessible. We may therefore consider whether somebody is likely to have access to safe and assistive transport to your venue. We may also think about whether there are any obstacles that may hinder their arrival to and access of your dance space. For instance, raised curbs or entrance obstructions. If the door is not accessible, for example if it's too heavy, what's in place for a user to inform you that they need help getting into the building? Perhaps you have a member of staff or a fellow attendee on hand to do a meet and greet. A third important consideration is signage. Is this clear and concise to aid ease of reading? Does it contain universal symbols or infographics for readers who may not be able to engage with written text? Can somebody who is new to your space easily navigate around the entire building independently and safely? Finding number two is about digital delivery. One participant explained to us that Digital teaching means that people don't necessarily need to have access to the space in order to be able to access the work. So, it can potentially be a much more accessible way of enabling dance to happen. However, I would suggest that any dance that has a financial cost to it isn't inclusive. Relative to cost, we may consider that although recent developments in digital engagement options have made dance cheaper and easier to access in some instances, how are those in digital poverty being reached? Does your digital offering work asynchronously with your in-person delivery for those who do not have digital access and vice versa? Another valuable consideration was identified as the importance of being able to plan ahead and set expectations. Before visiting your physical space, can the user go online to learn about the staff facilitating the space or find out more about room or corridor dimensions, for example? Are there details of nearby accessible shops and facilities or details of travel and parking on your website or social media outputs? Ask yourself how user-friendly your website is. Do you use web accessibility tools, features or functions? Are photographs, online virtual tours or audio descriptions available of your space? Our third finding relates to inclusive diction and diverse communication. Here we are referring to how language is used within dance that aims to avoid certain words or expressions that could exclude individuals. Diverse communication refers to alternative modes of expression that, for example, go beyond spoken or written English. When asked what considerations do you think should be priorities, one participant replied, when we think about access we automatically think of buildings and ramps and what's needed to physically be there. Yet actually, if your language is limited, then the person can't access the space anyway. One consideration for improvement was therefore identified as the importance of recognising open and closed vocabulary. For example, using the phrase turn to the right assumes a neurotypical group of dancers, whereas turn to face the door opens the language by focusing on spatial cues rather than directional. It's also beneficial to pay greater attention to how we can demonstrate, communicate and translate in multiple ways to suit a variety of learners. A final consideration for best practice that was highlighted was to encourage greater use of diverse communication skills. Is there somebody on hand who is trained in British Sign Language or Makaton? Are venue staff or dance teachers otherwise able to communicate in non-verbal, non-literate ways, such as through using visuals or assistive technologies such as hearing loops or speech-to-text and text-to-speech software? 
All of these considerations, if prioritised, could mean greater, more equitable access to dance for a range of diverse individuals. Limitations of our study. Convenient sampling was used to recruit participants, the process of which may therefore be prone to selection bias. Member checking took place as part of a focus group rather than individually, which not all participants were able to attend. Much of the information collected about individuals with multiple and profound learning difficulties came second-hand from dance teachers and facilitators rather than coming directly from the individuals themselves. Conclusions Thus far, research findings from the project have been successful in enabling us to better understand the access experiences and needs of the community we serve and some of the disabling barriers within dance spaces where creative, artistic and conceptual work comes to life. Access considerations are intersectional and layered. They require further discussion of the complex interactions that impact dance practice. What this project has taught us so far is that enabling access to dance doesn't begin in the studio or Zoom room, at the entrance to the building or on somebody's journey to the dance space. Whilst each one of these steps present us with a host of ways in which we should be willingly considering difference, the starting point needs to be re-evaluating how we think about dance in the first place. The way that we approach ideas of difference and access needs to be more open-minded, thoughtful and considered. It's important that these deliberations happen at ground, leadership and board level more thoroughly and frequently through the lens of the social model of disability. Next steps. Greater investment of time, resources and research is required to grasp a more comprehensive understanding of how we can work together as a sector to more effectively overcome barriers faced by those of us with access requirements and so that dance venues, educators, choreographers and other stakeholders can become more synchronised in accessing and actioning ideas that address positive change in accommodating difference. The sector would also benefit from research that investigates the health and well-being impact of dance accessibility for individuals with access requirements. Next steps for One Lunch UK include the development of our accessible resources, including the release of our first Considering Difference Making Dance Accessible information sheet. This will be available in a range of alternative audio-visual formats. Please feel free to email us at hdp at onelunchuk.org if you have any questions about our wider Considering Difference project or this presentation. Thank you.